session will be the following the same uh, format. So we are here in Helsinki, but we have also a lot of guests uh, who are online. Uh, there will be a um, discussion with a moderator and two panelists. And after there is a possibility of Q&A here in Helsinki and of course online. And if you do it here uh, in Helsinki, it's also important to introduce yourself also for visual impairment uh, person and also to introduce eventually your organization. So I'm very glad now to leave the word to Marta Kiel, who will be the moderator of this session. Uh, and you will have like two speakers, so I'm sorry for the pronunciation, Heger Narvik Sander and Abitarik. Enjoy the session. Thank you so much, Marie. Very warm welcome to every one of you being here with us offline and for the ones who are joining us online. I'm extremely happy to be with you today and with two wonderful speakers that we will delve into the conversation with in a second. But before that, I will very shortly introduce myself. My name is Marta Kail, and I'm an independent uh, performing arts curator based between Warsaw and Utrecht. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm an, a white woman in my late 30s. I wear glasses. Um, I have kind of blonde hair and I'm wearing a kind of yeah, gray shirt. Um, and maybe um, before uh, settling the ground for our conversation, I would like to share with you um, yeah, the context from which I speak in order to situate my, um, yeah, my um, view and my perspective on the topic we'll touch, which is the digital international professional development. So in a way, it's of course a continuation of what we have been talking about already this morning. We focus more, mostly or broadly, not only on the artists, but mainly on artists, art workers or artists, art practitioners. And, um, and from my own perspective, as they've been curator that for many years uh, that was raised in Poland and for many years have been based in Poland, the transnational activity was always key or was always something that would keep me standing, especially in the recent years where the local background became quite hostile. And therefore, uh, the online encounters or educational platforms that were possible during the pandemic was the way to yeah, keep standing, if you like. But also, I would like to, to bring here another perspective on that. Um, I think that very um, possibility to somehow stay connected, but maybe not necessarily always build new connections, uh, was really important during the pandemic time, but also it created a lot of hopes, if you like, or desires or, or, or wishes and dreams. And I wanted to quote here a, a South African choreographer and activist, Mamela Nyamza, who said uh, it was during the pandemic, during the wonderful conference, how to be together, organized by Turing Theater Spectacle and Tanzim August in Berlin. She said that the dreams that uh, we are asked to dream and that remain as a kind of unfulfilled promise may keep haunting us. And maybe uh, especially difficult in the moment where the imagination kind of gets crushed by the reality and by the context very often social, political, economic, name it. Um, and it feels extremely important to address that topic also today, especially having in mind that we are talking, we are gathering here um, in the moment when there is a war uh, going on in many places uh, in Europe, in Ukraine, but not only. Um, so please let me welcome uh, two wonderful speakers that are with us today, Heger Narvik Sander and Abitarik. Uh, Heger is a CEO of Performing Arts Harp Norway, and that is a center that um, uh, is a performing arts advisor, but also manages the ministry or uh, travel grants that allow the Norwegian performing artists to be presented abroad. Um, and um, Sande has extensive experience in organizational development and also in political advocacy. And I guess that might be also a very interesting point to address today, not only to maintain uh, the international connections and transnational co collaboration, not only to create conditions for the artists to be welcomed and presented and received not only in their own local context, but also the way how to advocate for that. Um, and Abi 
Uh, Abitarik is uh, an artist and cultural worker born, born in Karachi and based in Paris. Uh, at the moment, uh, Abi works as a communication manager for Council, which is an art organization based in Paris, founded by Gregory Castera and Sandra Tergiman uh, in Paris. And currently, uh, Abi runs the project A Field, which is a network of social initiative from arts and culture that supports Cultural practice that supports cultural practitioners who develop initiatives and different projects uh, that would create bonds between their own practices and the given local communities. Um, and Abby is also an artist, and his practice confronts issues of power, privilege, vulnerability, uh, and social expectations through performance art. And I'm mentioning that because I believe that might be a point to come back to at some point when we when we continue our, our conversation. That will be my very short introduction of both of you. And I believe there will be a moment uh, to, uh, to, to broad it and to really focus on your practices while um, the floor will be yours. Just before that, please let me very shortly draw you a little bit of a picture or a kind of landscape what we want to touch upon today. Uh, yeah, it's, I, I think it's extremely important to understand that we uh, meet here at the moment, which seems to be the end of the pandemic, but as we all know, it's definitely not yet. So it feels like indeed this notion that Boyana mentioned the, of the honeymoon in the digital world seems to be still a little bit at stake because we are right after that very experience where for many of us, I believe, digital tools might have been helpful. But also, I guess we understood a lot of limits of these very tools, and it would be wonderful to touch upon them today. Um, and in many cases, I believe uh, uh, the, the development of the, of the professional uh, career, but also a simple uh, your own practice and way of thinking, uh, while being isolated for many reasons, not only by pandemic, but also by the political circumstances, one is isolated in one location, the ability to connect uh, elsewhere or to think with others that are situated in different contexts might be key in order to develop uh, the way of thinking and in order to especially to keep the practice going on while the local background is hostile, while you don't feel very welcome in your own local uh, backgrounds. But then um, while many participants of online educational platforms or schools underline how important that uh, presence of these very platforms was for them, they also underlined that in, in many cases it was the first time they really could, they could become part of the network because, for instance, they didn't have to deal with the visa, visa regulations, as, as we all know, it can be extremely humiliating and absurd. But at the same time, uh, many of them pointed out that actually there were a lot of networks, um, for instance, curatorial ones that were maintained, but they would rather be focused on already existing relations and networks. They would rather be the ones who would be possible to maintain because they were created before a hand uh, on the basis of the live gathering. So that would be one of the limitations I point out, I point out. And the other, again, is maybe a kind of illusion that this uh, digital space as a possible public space uh, can offer and the question how to overcome it. And in order to address it, I would love to start our conversation with the first question to both of you that is focused on the uh, on the needs. So I would love to learn and to hear from you whether there are any particular needs uh, expressed by the art workers, art practitioners related to the development of their practices, uh, any particular needs related also to the development of their competences that you identified during the last year, two years or before, something you would like to, um, to build upon and uh, whether there were any urgencies that shaped it, that very, they, the, these very needs or whether there were any urgencies that would shape particular competences that we might need at the moment. Avi, would you like to start? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Marta. Thank you on the move for the invitation. Um, my name is Abi Tariq. I am a brown skinned um, man in my early 30s. I'm wearing a white shirt um, and I have long dark hair tied in a ponytail. Um, I go by he, him or they. Um, and to answer your question about needs, um, what we noticed, what I noticed, mainly in terms of this kind of political turmoil and uh, and then COVID on top of it all, was the 
need to become to have a political stand to take a position because um, which I think Alma mentioned earlier with the project around citizen journalists. Um, a lot of my role as community manager, as communication manager, um, became almost like journalism. I almost, I really had to think about what news I was putting out there and where we were like situating ourselves. Um, so that's one that I think is quite evident and still is. And I think that's something that continues. We, we've become like, it's heightened that idea of needing to position yourself somewhere or not. And when you don't, then that has consequences as well. Um, uh, apart from that, again, I think something that was mentioned earlier, I think this idea of uh, um, recognition and solidarity. So it was again heightened during the pandemic, this feeling that um, people who are working locally somewhere in the world confronting a social issue that is um, very present for them uh, may not have the a network or somebody else supporting them elsewhere so this this has existed before the pandemic but i feel like the pandemic heightened this where it became really apparent that you know somebody on the other end of the planet uh, reaches out to you and has a conversation and is really interested and supportive of what you're doing locally, which uh, that kind of support you might not have locally. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt like that was something that was heightened. And then the other thing I think was um, the reassessment of the way that we uh, look at time and efficiency. Um, a lot of this uh, people's kind of daily lives and other obligations were pouring into the Zoom calls and um, so it became really apparent that uh, flexibility was this new keyword that everybody had to use. And, you know, um, we just allowed for babies on screen and, and, you know, things to not follow. I think everybody became really um, okay with not knowing also, because there was so much of like not knowing what the next step was or if things were going to be possible. So I think those are the kind of key um, aspects that I would highlight and maybe pass it on to Hege. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much for the invitation. I'm Hege Knavik Sande and I'm a beam woman. Uh, in my begin beginning of my 40s, I have silver hair and blue eyes and today I'm wearing a white shirt. Uh, yes, I totally agree with you, uh, Abi, for what, what, you, what you're saying here and for for us and for like from the organization perspective, I would say like for the two last year, we've all been like a survival mode. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we all had a huge need or to maintain our activities and also to stay in contact with our colleagues, uh, but also be a part of communities to share knowledge, but also to get comfort and support. Uh, because it has been a time of crisis um <laughs> i think that's important to say uh, and it's, it's been a crisis especially for artists uh, within the performing art and for, for music because these are art forms that are live uh, and both these sectors has in principle stood still uh, for two years uh, they have not been able to perform or practice their profession uh, and i think that's also important to think about um so but that also means that we, in the last two years, have experienced an enormous uh, transformation. And we also identified a strong willingness to change into using digital needs, uh, the, the, the digital tools. And uh, this transformation I also experienced in my own organization. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about my work. And um, the, the, our main task in PAN is to give international mo mobility opportunities for Norwegian artists. Uh, so that means that we fund and stimulate uh, the possibility for Norwegian artists to have touring opportunities international. And of course, you all understand that that has not been possible for the last two years. Uh, so we could not work in the same way as we used to. But we really try to um, transform the way we worked as everyone else. Uh, and it was very important for us to maintain the relationship that we had internationally, because this relationship we have been building up for several years. 
uh, and it's also important for us to maintain this relationship for the artist uh, so that we can go, go back and actually uh, start touring again. Um, we also have a traveling funding that we change uh, to fulfill the needs for the Norwegian artists. So we have a traveling funding that we also uh, transformed into digital uh, touring. That they could uh, apply for funding for digital touring. And of course, uh, that also was something that happened for the last two years that artists started presenting their work digitally. And of course, that also uh, identified some needs because it's hard to become a filmmaker from one day to another. Uh, so uh, if we're going to talk about uh, what we identified as uh, like needs, are we there? You want me to go further? Yes, yes. please go ahead. So Absolutely. then we need to develop skills to actually do this, to actually mm -hmm. present something digitally. And that would mean uh, you need to understand uh, you, the, the last panel was talking a bit about it, that you need actually to present something digitally. And that is our own skill. Uh, you also need to have access to equipment to do it. And for our, um, our independent artists in Norway, or I would say everywhere, you don't have access to that equipment. And you might not even have access to a place where you can borrow that equipment. So, of course, that is a need that we identified. Yeah, I think I can stop there. But, uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hagar. Thank you, Abby. Um, what I'm hearing is very clear articulation of the needs that we need in order to stay or to catch up with the digital, digital world. And I understand also that probably the need of having a, a, an access to the right equipment or to the good equipment is also a matter of being uh, audible and visible well enough because also there's probably a rising competent competition. In that, in that very field. So if you have an access to the, to the better tool, better you are ahead and visible, obviously. And I was wondering, um, uh, so for that, that's, that's a huge need. And this is also the moment where the, the notion of the uh, yeah, equality in terms of the accesses applies. So I wonder whether there are any ways, we also talked about a little bit in the previous, uh, in the previous panel of any kind of legal structures and regulations that would support it also on the, let's say, public level that would support, especially the independent artist. But there's also another layer that I found extremely important in what you were mentioning, both of you, which is the notion of the maintenance of the relationships that happened during the pandemic. And also this need to take a political stance, like to, 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 um, to take a certain position from which you are speaking and use indeed in that sense digital space as a public one, or at least as a certain, let's say, alternative to the public one. And I was wondering whether you could identify any yeah, elements or any particular features that made it possible, any particular tools, something that you feel was helping for both of you when it comes to yeah, maintaining uh, professional, but I guess also very human relationships with your peers and colleagues. Um. So I want to, yeah, I'm going to answer your question, but link it mm -hmm. to something that's been said. Um, so in the context of, of a political situation, for example, I'll give a personal example that I think was very pertinent. Um, so the war in Ukraine started and I'm a Pakistani person living in Paris who refrains from indulging in much political stuff based on my own personal history and the current like legal status and passport I have and stuff. So for me, I really didn't have a position in this situation and I didn't know how to offer anything. So for a few days, I was really like kind of walking around, feeling all these things, but not being able to do anything. And I got a phone call from my Polish friend. And this is where I think it's really interesting, this idea of like maintained relationships that you have that end up facilitating um, a different contextualization for the issue. So what happened is my Polish friend calls me because the Polish people were uh, so deeply implicated, uh, saying, hey, Abby, you're in Paris, I've got a network, we're looking for places, can you help? And she just plugged me right in and all of a sudden I had 
a position and I knew that, okay, here's what I can do. And here's uh, somebody who's given me a context in order to actually uh, do something about it and have a position, even if like, and so I got removed from the equation and I just got um, plugged in. So this was a very somehow in a roundabout way, trying to answer your question mm -hmm. about this maintaining relationships and how this became a tool somehow, this earlier relationship with somebody that became a tool. Um, and then, I guess this isn't the bit about what worked well, or is it? Because <laughs> this is more about tools. So I'm going to exactly. maybe, maybe pass it on. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe just uh, one additional question to what you just shared, which is a beautiful example. But again, I'm wondering how much it was possible because you had already some connection beforehand based on the life encounter and whether there would be any uh, examples of the solidarity of maintenance that was possible and that started over the uh, yeah, digital world. Right, yeah. So um, with the field, so field is a network of socially engaged practitioners who've taken a step beyond their own practice in order to confront a social issue somewhere in the world. And we're essentially a grant that was given to three people. It's a horizontal nomination process. So every year there's three people joining the network and they're really high caliber people like doing or who've already set up initiatives that are already making a huge difference. So it's more about recognizing these people who've already made a huge change in a way and just saying, keep going, we're with you. Um, so what happened right as the pandemic hit was that, so this was just a network um, and these people didn't really know each other, even though they felt like, okay, we're in the same network, but the pandemic, like, Right as the pandemic started, we started something called the Kitchen Calls, which became this monthly uh, call where the whole network was invited to just come online and exchange and share knowledge. And this continued forward now, uh, even though at a reduced frequency, because you know things have come back into real life things and people are more busy again. But basically, uh, this Kitchen Call it became a space to share political, um, like ongoings so the kazakh contingent showed up and talked about the kazakh situation that happened and uh, mm -hmm. so every time that like that kind of thing started happening but really during the pandemic these kitchen calls allowed us to witness the network growing into a community mm -hmm. and it really like this was just clear as day and all of a sudden uh, we start to consider each other friends, even if we've never even met each other, but now we've, and we started producing more media elements. I think this is also interesting. Everybody started producing more videos and started like, you know, maximizing a media output because that's what we could do with the, and, you know, with the reduced budget, budget over Zoom calls and stuff. Um, so this, I think Kitchen Call was really something that um, kind of embodied solidarity and has now led to this community really feeling like a community who are now working towards an event so they can all meet each other and now whenever i meet somebody who i've already worked with for the past two years but i've never met it's like oh my god you're shorter than i expected or oh you're really <laughs> tall and oh, and i feel like i already know you and um so this is, has been really uh, positive in that sense thank you so much for sharing that Hega, would you like to share some example of like a maintenance that was possible. Yeah, I can uh, I can talk about the, some some of the activities that we did, um, but that would be a, an example on maintaining with, with our relationships, mm -hmm. and that would be we ha we um, some of the things that we do is uh, to have trade missions that we we travel with the delegation of Norwegian artists to a marketplace and present the Norwegian arts. And we have this huge event in New York every year. It's called Norway Now, uh, where Norwegian artists are meeting uh, North American presenters. Uh, so this event we, had ne we needed to do um, digitally twice now. And for us, that's like so important to be able to and be in touch with our network uh, because as I said before this is like a relationships that we have built up in several years and it takes such a long time also to build this relationship so for us if we uh, if this connection would be not I mean, we wouldn't be in contact with them for two years that would be crucial for our work um, and it went very well. Uh, so the Norwegian artists, they pitched their work for the presenters. The thing, uh, we also put out the event digitally at, uh, on YouTube. And uh, the things that we could see is that we actually uh, 
we got a broader audience. Uh, we reach more people. And of course, things that we don't know, uh, that we don't have knowledge on today is if it actually succeeded in more invitation to touring. I, I don't have the answer to that, but we definitely maintained uh, our collaboration and uh, yeah, the, the relationships and we also uh, reached a wider audience. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And the, I'm also wondering, because what I'm hearing is, um, is a lot of uh, effort put into creating the space where the uh, exchange is possible when uh, in the offline world is absolutely not possible at a particular moment or is very much restricted. And I was wondering, what do you think, what, make, what made it possible? Like, what did, what did you need in order to make possible either the, yeah, maintaining the relations with the artists who couldn't tour at some point, but still wanted to get in touch and, and continue the relationship with possible curators, presenters, or what, would, what did it mean to create a space for the kitchen call? Like, what, what made it possible? Like what kind of attitude, uh, yeah, what kind of yeah, competence? Is there something that we could also maybe think of as a lesson to take with, um, for instance, maybe to, um, to give an example of, uh, yeah, of, of a situation I, I personally experienced, maybe that would also help to situate uh, yours. Um, that would be the moment when we stopped, and that refers very much what you said, Abby, about the efficiency. So that was the moment when um, being involved in different projects, at some point we realized, okay, we really have no idea um, whether we will end up with any kind of product or outcome after that. What we need is a space to exchange no matter what, or even if it's a little bit awkward because we don't have a, an agenda of that very meeting, but we open the space. There is this um, project and part of uh, Advanced Performing Arts uh, project where we actually created this kind of campfire talks with the artists who were new to the network. So that was that felt very similar to your kitchen call. And I wonder, what do you think, what kind of um, competences or, or, or skills we need for that? I'm also thinking about what was mentioned already in the previous panel, like for instance, the patience or ability to listen mm -hmm. um, and maybe time is there anything that's yeah recalls with your experiences uh, yeah absolutely i would say time is really the only thing i have to talk about here because i feel like our notion of time changed then and has kind of changed again now and continues to change because at that time of the pandemic i think people just had more time. So, you know, you could be in the room with important people that you couldn't find time to meet earlier, for sure. But also, I think that I remember we were having them regularly every month, and then eventually we had to reduce them. And I remember at that time, they were longer, they were an hour and a half. And we were also like, um, I was programming you know like stretching and like not exactly but you know just like animating it and finding ways to to fill the time and 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 think about the fact that people are at home and they're stuck at home and which now is different right because we're not stuck at home anymore so so it's the shorter thing now and people are coming and going uh and it i feel like people were just more present then because they had the time isn't isn't it a thing that everybody was started cooking during the pandemic and you know because people were just at home and they really could they had a little bit more time somehow we were weren't com commuting as, as much and weren't traveling so um i think time was really uh, our our perception of time was really key to to making this possible mm -hmm. yeah yeah, and we had a meeting before this uh, panel. We shared we, we shared some personal experience, and uh, it's like that in my job as well. I'm often talking with politicians, and during the pandemic, it was so easy to get in touch with politicians. They were just sitting home and taking every call, and uh, yeah. But now that's totally different again. Uh, so I definitely agree with you that time is has been um, yeah, and. We'll, probably be a challenge now when everything opens up again. Um, but of course, um, regarding your question, uh, it definitely needs skills to present something digitally. Mm -hmm. It's a totally different thing. And I'm not sure, I don't think that we did it our best. I felt like we were in a survival mode, uh, as I said. Uh, but we are a part of a, a EDU or um, Erasmus Plus project now that's called the Digital Leap. Uh, which is a program that we're trying to 
get more knowledge on how we, we, we will present something digitally and what, what kind of different tools that we could use to present performing art digitally. So this is a super interesting project. And uh, yeah, I guess more projects like that we, we, we need. And um, uh, it's also like important to have like conversation and conference like this uh, that we go back and reflect that we not just now move on because uh, it was a lot of things that happened was, was going on these two years and it's a lot of different platforms we have all different experience uh, so that's also important to identify uh, all the digital tools that we used yeah. but from what i'm hearing from both of you speaking it feels really like time is key but also um a time that we are kind of deprived of at the moment being in a way able to continue to business as usual and i wonder what's what's the way not to continue business as usual probably one of the strategies is to address the way how we are assessed how our work is being assessed right by the funders or by the decision makers and i wonder whether you know any examples or initiatives or a yeah, dialogue that would take place on that very level because it really feels um uh, the need for change has to come as a grassroots movement, but it won't be able to, to, to make its reality if it's not as addressed on the level how, for instance, we are assessed at what we have to do in order to continue the practice or receive another fund and so on and so forth. That sometimes can be a vicious circle, right? So I'm wondering whether, um, whether you see any initiatives that would continue that or would sustain with the yeah, time that is not necessarily oriented towards the production immediately um whether there would be any educational for instance projects that would continue this way or maybe that's the way how a field is developing or how do you see that um it i mean it feels like uh, what comes to mind is the project uh, correspondence mm -hmm. uh which was initiated in uh response to the to the to the blast in Beirut by um, a bunch of people who um, were affected by this, Lebanese people, and and but then with a with quite a connection to France, and they they started this um, platform. The reason I mentioned this is because it was so open. This was what was magical about it was that it was it wasn't like we're looking for you know this kind of people, these kinds of people to give funding to or to give opportunities to. Um, it wasn't. It was just like people in Lebanon, artists and cultural practitioners who need anything can apply for anything, for however much, you know, from it, you just express your desire. And this goes back to what, again, Alma was talking about this idea of like oxygen. Mm -hmm. It was this idea that they just needed oxygen. They just needed something, anything they needed, whether it was a camera or whether it was like uh, a relationship with somebody or whether they needed to fly somewhere, whether they needed a residency. So it was just a space that was created, a platform online where uh, Lebanese artists, and it was circulated through word of mouth predominantly, and people just uh, found out about it and got on there and um, and asked for whatever they needed and then kind of case by case those things were met and then yesterday I heard in conversation over dinner uh, that that they actually got some fund uh, some funding from the French uh, some French funding basically so that was also an interesting way to kind of pull in French funding for a cause that is not necessarily um, French uh, you know related so I think that's an interesting example to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, can you say that your question? Of course, I was wondering whether, um, yeah, there is a way to sustain the initiatives or uh, that were created in a way in the survival mode, or probably correspondence is also an example of that as an answer to an emergency situation. It feels like these are the moments or the kind of ruptures of the everyday pace, right? Of the ongoingness of the constant production. And as we all know, very often it's an overproduction. And I was wondering whether there would be, um, whether you recall any initiatives or examples of uh, yeah, um, ways of thinking, again, initiatives, projects that would rather focus on maintaining this luxury of having time just to get together and think not only as an answer as an, for an emergency or not only yeah. when the other is not possible yeah no i don't know uh, i can't give you an example on a mm. project on that but i think it would be crucial for every organization and everyone to like live in our hybrid world from now on and of course uh, that means that you need to have skills you need to make sure you have fundings for that artists could produce something digitally 
uh, yeah, so of course, I think that's the future. We need to live in this hybrid world. world. Yeah. And it feels also that probably we have to uh, think about the multi multi multitude of voices here. I mean, with a singular voices, we will not probably make that uh, happen. But that brings me um, to to another question um, related very much to the yeah, actual political societal uh, economic context we operate at the moment that is also very different in the case of each and every of us but there are some urgencies like war in ukraine that feels there is an urge to um to address and i was wondering whether you have um what, what are your thoughts about yeah what do we need in order to or it, can we uh, do you have that experience use the digital tools as a way to uh, secure the exchange when it's not possible because of the uh, of the of the circumstances because of the war because of the very severe and, and, and hostile political context i'm asking that question um also because knowing that there is a lot of ambiguity in that very one um but also because i i really feel we are in a moment where um yeah we might tend to think oh digital will kind of save the world but we also probably know already it won't or it might be very helpful, but uh, to the certain extent, and I wonder, yeah, how to grasp it? How can we make still use of it? And what we should forget in order not to uh, end up in the in this, yeah, haunted and un unfulfilled dreams? Yeah, um, that was a big question. Um, I think that uh, like using the digital tools and they, of course, uh, can you you actually had a question for us in <laughs> you said we're on the fourth now right yes uh how can digital who use help to secure free exchange mm -hmm. you asked us and that mm -hmm. that question made my brain boil a bit because mm -hmm. uh, that is a huge question and uh, i think that uh, of course if digital tools are going to save the world, that means that everyone, we need to make sure that everyone has access to it, That's, that you need to have some basic, everyone needs to have Wi-Fi, everyone needs to have computers, and of course we know that not everyone has that. I think also that, uh, but this new uh, digital world could also help us um, with access in removing financial barriers by traveling, for example. Uh, it could also be easier for people to connect time-wise. Um, we could also, uh, it could also assist, assist with translation or like language barriers. Mm -hmm. uh, and also disability barriers. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a lot of barriers that could be solved digitally. But when you ask this question, I also wanted to talk a bit about um, the ideal of a free exchange. Mm -hmm. And I said, told you guys that I want to share a story, a personal story. And this is a story that happened to me like now in February. I I'm going to read it because I feel my English is a bit limited and I want this to be very precisely. Um, so I want to share an experience with, with a high I had in February this year when I went to an art festival in, in the northern of Norway in a city called Kirkenes. Uh, which shares a border uh, with Russia. Uh, the art festival is called Barnes Patakel and is built on cooperation uh, with the countries in the Barnes region. It's Finland and Russia. And this year's festival uh, had a title, Where do we go from, uh, from here? And was reflecting on the two year close down between these countries uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, it had, the, the pandemic had really made it difficult for the festival to maintain artistic collaboration with Russian Finnish artists. And still at that moment, the border was closed. So the festi pro festival program had a lot of digital talks with both Norwegian and Russian artists. Um, this festival, it opened the February 23rd. And the next day, um, Russia went to war uh, against uh, Ukraine. And the festival continued as planned. All the conversation continued as well. Uh, but we were not longer talking about the pandemic. Uh, we shared the grief over the inv invasion of Ukraine. And those days felt like the last day we had like an open and free conversation with the Russian artists. And the final artwork at the festival, uh, everyone traveled uh, to the border of, of Russia uh, to experience a work of art by two artists on 
both sides uh, would send sound signals to each other across the border. And a sound signal was sent from the Norwegian side, but there was no response. And just one day later, we learned that Russia uh, censored social media platform and you could risk 15 years in prison if you spoke negatively about the invasion. And I want to share this story because uh, it made a huge um, yeah, impact on me, uh, but also it kind of puts out uh, address that digital tools for free exchange, you also need to have freedom to speak. And that will also be some of the basic that we <laughs> need to have in, uh, yeah, to, in the world. And do you see any, let's say, dark web, um, yeah, outside official channels that may, um, may let us keep a contact with the one who are on the resistance position but cannot leave the country for this or that reason? Yeah, I think that, that exists today. Yeah, mm. definitely. But of course, it's not open. It's not free. It's not accessible for everyone. So, but it's a tool, definitely. Yeah, I'm just thinking about yeah, yeah. anything that may keep standing the ones who yeah. are left, uh, maybe not on the side that they would have chosen. No. Mm -hmm. Thank you mm -hmm. so much for sharing that experience. Um, yeah, to add to that, I would say like these ruptures have created um, a situation where people working on the fringes, whether they're hackers or people doing things differently because of their given situation, uh, like are now allowed to come to center stage in a way. And, um, and so all these, uh, yeah, alternative realities that people are trying to build are all of a sudden very interesting to for us to co-opt and create and and make uh the mainstream again you know uh the way that the whole thing is set up the the the, the, the structure that is capitalism that we all are deeply entangled with um and i mean so i'll link that to the idea of um the roots um, which I think that are often they're often overlooked, and we don't often enough talk about you know the the, the funding bodies and 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 how they are actually ruling the show. Or, or when we talk about internet and access, and we say that you know everybody should have access to internet. I mean, we are rarely talking about uh, the very few telecommunications companies who actually own the internet of mm -hmm. the whole planet, and how uh, you know how that is a monopoly in itself and and if we're going to talk about the dark web and stuff then you know there's there's just so much uh, that we don't know and that's that's not transparent there so um so this is why people working on the fringes i mean the whole i read something yesterday that the, um, about the blockchain and nft and this whole new world uh came from or part of it a lot of it came from exactly this kind of investigation that people on the sidelines were doing kind of illegally, let's say, you know, mm -hmm. and now all of a sudden it's very interesting for all of us to talk about NFTs and blockchains and how it's become useful for us to think about um, organizing differently and imagining a different reality. Um, and then that along with, I would say this, uh, the title of this event that you mentioned, like, where do we go from here? I think is also very, um, uh, on point in the sense that we were asking the same questions. We developed a study program where we started inviting, we took the opportunity to, to say, okay, well, if our network is growing by three people every year, what about these other people who almost made it? You know, the, what about the short list of 12 other people? And so we created another moment of like a study program online, uh, which we're continuing this year. And last year it was called Together. And it was really asking this question of like, what can we do together, mm -hmm. you know, with three different angles. And this year it's about um, the construction of ableism. So I think these questions of, um, like you know taking language barriers so the i wanted to mention that there's a limit one of the limitations that that we experienced through this entire process was language mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. as much as the network became a community and we you know so many things flourished and we all of a sudden literally a field became independent over the you know it was just a project and now it's like kind of an organization um one of the main limitations was language we realized that we were just functioning english and we weren't really 
opening enough uh, to allow for our Spanish contingent and for our Portuguese contingent to show up. And so then they just wouldn't show up. So, and now, you know, and I think these are the kinds of things where that rupture creates the possibility for us to be like, oh, wait, this is where we can improve. And so then, you know, we're slowly trying to integrate, uh, to improve our practices um, and care more about um, otherness and how to integrate that into what we do to make the plane more horizontal. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, what I'm hearing is that maybe one of the competences that we might all need in the field is to really get more specialized in the dark web or get more specialized in this um, actions that is actually developing quite a lot at the moment, which is this position of being a cyber elf. Um, my dear friend who is a theater maker, theater director, completely withdrew, resign, resigned from her practice as a theater maker. Uh, her name is Magda Specht. She's based in, in Warsaw in Poland. And she started really to focus all day long on the internet activism, which means being a cyber elf, so fighting against the Putin propaganda. So answering, it's really going very deeply to dismantling the fake news, uh, really contacting people um, uh, on, on a personal layer, uh, informing them what's going on really, and so on and so forth, that, that, that maybe that could be one of the tools or one of the spaces where also the artistic tools mm -hmm. and the way how, how, to, how to think about it as a perf performative gesture could, could very much help. Um, but at this moment, I would really love to open the conversation to, to our audience, both here present with us and online. Uh, do you have any questions or immediate reactions towards that? Yeah. Katie? I have a question and I have the and microphone. I would, so. <laughs> and I would love to invite you to, to say your name, uh, describe yourself and say what's the organization you might represent. Sorry for the dictatorship of the microphone. <laughs> Um, my name's Katie. I work for On The Move. I have curly hair and pale skin and a striped shirt. Is that good enough? Okay. Um, thank you both. Um, thank you to the three of you um, for your contributions. I, um, it speaks to what I've been interested in developing personally for the last two years at the intersection of journalism and digital projects, um, in addition to the work that I do um, as with research and publications at On The Move. And this is, I apologize, I'm one of those comments instead of questions people today. But, <laughs> um, I have to say that um, what, I've, what I've observed personally and also in discussions with other people is that there's been a real resistance to the idea of how much these projects can cost in terms of time and investment. Um, mm -hmm. I think that, and I think that also generally, generationally, the people who are really tasked with upskilling themselves digitally are people who are younger in these spaces. So people who are, um, broadly are already dealing with all kinds of structural issues and barriers, including just being less well paid because we're younger <laughs> and then we're we're tasked we're often tasked with like go figure out how to make a digital project or <laughs> sometimes we task ourselves with that because we can see possibilities that people who are older just can't by virtue of many different factors um and one thing that i've encountered and observed is just a, is is we acquire an enough knowledge to to go to people and say if you really want to do this well and pay everyone fairly, this is how much it's going to cost. Um, and I think that there's a real resistance to it because somehow there's this there's this thing of like when when many of these products are well done, it's like oh it's easy or it doesn't take that much time or <laughs> and stuff like that. And that I think is is a real problem. And so um, I think we where I'm at, it's also like we need we need to help each other have the skills to defend the resources that we need to like transition to this kind of um, digital space um, and have the language to like go to funders or go to partners and be like this is this is not an adequate budget for the ambitions that you have related to this um, and i think that it's it's something that i find particularly egregious in the context of the arts where like where like why why is it why is it so difficult to get someone to accept that that's how much 
intellectual and digital artistic labor costs when you when it's easy to see how much work and time goes into making a theater production, for example. And so um, speaking like generation generationally, I want the people who are in more positions of power. I want us, I want, I want us to work together to understand how we can defend the resources that we need in order to upskill and produce things of quality and not just be, and not just produce something for the sake of producing it that because when things are quality they have more potential to be spread and be impactful basically um i don't know if any of the speakers want to react to that <laughs> we can both react to it yeah uh, no i totally agree with you and we can uh, we can stay here to uh, talk about all the good experience but i totally agree with, with you that um, it's been a survival modus for many of us, and uh, the quality has not always been very good. So if we are going to do this for the future, we need to have more skills and we need to have fundings for it, definitely. Um, I would like to, yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think the most important part, one of the most important parts of what you've said is that the people in the pos in the power positions need to be the ones that kind of hand it forward that continue to as we talked about last night again uh at dinner this idea that you need to hand it forward you need to like make sure that those uh you know pay people make sure make sure you pay people appropriately and make sure that your colleagues are paying people and we're all culprits i feel like uh because sometimes the budget is just what it is and so then you end up outsourcing the work from a different country for the same work because you have to and you just have to make it work and you're you know and but i think the more that we you know not i wouldn't say pressure each other but hold each other accountable and kind of support each other in 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 making that happen uh i think that's for the people who are sitting in positions of power where and then on that note i would like to share a um there's an initiative uh, called the ethics of collecting it has to do with the mm -hmm. art world and um collectors in the art world and they've a bunch of collectors have come together to write a code of ethics and they've based it on a codes of ethics that exist in other um fields because there isn't one in the art world and they're they're predominantly talking about the ethics of collecting but it's really um a good they're creating a tool which is open to conversation and they're happy to adapt it but this is the kind of movement that we need uh especially in the art world even more than i would say the cultural sector because again i think the cultural sector still has a little bit more structure even though i think people are still being exploited um and then on the question of quality i think that on the one hand we can say that you know we don't want good quality things um but on the other hand i think it's really fascinating again to notice how uh, you know somebody making memes 10 years ago uh wasn't that we that wasn't considered quality it wasn't considered something uh interesting or even subversive it felt like you were wasting your time or like computer nerds or like you know people who were spending their time playing video games or making video games and it, this was all considered a waste of time somehow in many ways in many professional fields and all of a sudden these are the skills that are now really like you know memes are actually a really advanced version of contemporary critique you know uh not all but you know they really are and so this this is a lot of it's interesting how the question of quality i think can change because when you say quality i see like high production value high a lot of money but i we've seen so much high production high production value a lot of money put into like really bad things you know like really banal basic stuff so yeah but it also feels that we are addressing here some of the key issues that stay in the in the offline art world as strong as they are like acknowledgement of the labor especially the emotional labor that is needed in order to make the artistic practice happen and so on and so forth and i'm wondering maybe then indeed the code of ethics and that, that would also be helpful in understanding what do we might mean, for instance, as to what are the values that we want to rely on in this digital world or in many digital worlds. And how do we understand them? Maybe that could be indeed one of the first steps. 
Um, um, another example that comes to mind is like, how much time do we actually need to debrief after every single Zoom call? Do we even think about it? How kind of how how much of the emotional labor is needed in the hosting this type of a conversation that is online? It's not only shutting off your screen or or, or, or muting yourself. It's really there is some space needed also to prepare and then to uh, to breathe again afterwards, which we seem to be very short of. Um, but just so that, that just as another yeah possible maybe next step based on everything that you that you shared. Um, are there any more questions? Yeah. Hello, uh, I'm Felix. I'm uh, male, white, and uh, have uh, blonde hair and a beard. And um, I have a question. I was uh, talking to a lot of um, Russian artists in the past two weeks um, who try to leave the country. And uh, one of the argument I heard quite often was that actually I'm not in danger right now, but I cannot use the software anymore. So my completely my financial, um, I, I cannot evolve financially because I cannot work anymore. Um, and uh, I mean, we like, we strongly rely on certain set of softwares like, um, I don't know, for instance, having access to Adobe products is really crucial for a lot of artists. And we are very used to pay like six euros a month um, to to have that access, but um, it's it's one company, and like either a state can decide to sanction it or the company itself can decide to sanction it, and that made me realize again how uh, important it is to um, to have knowledge on piracy, maybe in a certain way. <laughs> it's also what you said about like learning the dark web. And on the other hand, it's really important to keep on evolving or like developing open source softwares, even if there's like a like a main product, let's say that's really good. It's important to have that open source development going on. And I was wondering if that's actually something that, or what's your opinion about that? Should that be part of cultural funding actually, or should that be part of like cultural education to a certain degree? Um, because right now it's not as far as I see. Yeah. Do you want to react to that? Uh, yeah, I think definitely it should be part of funding to make sure that everyone has equipment to uh, like, yeah, to be digitally. And I guess that's a very special <laughs> uh, topic you, you or uh, like, what do you say, example that you address there. Uh, but the other thing you said that it should be, should it be in the training and definitely, um, so my expertise is not visual art, or that's performing arts. And of course, to perform, to, to film something that are performed live, it, that needs good skills to do. And if this is something that uh, performing artists need to do in the future, it should definitely be a part of their education. Because it's hard, as I said, it's hard to become a filmmaker from one day to another. And that is basically what you need to be. You need to understand how you can make the virtual experience and use the digital equipment as you were addressing also in the other conversation. Yeah. Um, I'll respond to you about how as much as it's you know uh, difficult to be a filmmaker, this event is purely being manipulated by one uh, screen and a bunch of these robotic situations. So I find that quite fascinating and sophisticated as technology that's succeeding uh, probably to, to create a very advanced uh, documentation of this event. So I think technology people will argue otherwise, even though I'm not, I'm not saying filmmaking is easy or anything. But to go to your question, I basically think that, yeah, you're talking about policy uh, and advocacy. And I think that, yeah, if, if, um, if cultural institutions could make it uh, a priority to, because the question is really about private companies. So Adobe, for example, would, you know, what is, who can convince Adobe to stop being a private company uh, and, and, you know, and, and share their resources with everybody, you know? Um, that's the question. I'm sure somebody can. And who is that person and how can we, and, and if, if a bunch of, you know, uh, cultural workers, especially supporting the visual arts, were to come together and push for that, I'm sure they could offer Adobe a deal that would work out, you know? It's just a matter of if we can actually convene to allow that. 
uh, to happen we you know i feel like a, i feel like this is that question of uh, hierarchy you know people in the position of power are just uh, not here or maybe they are but you know oftentimes it's like those are the important people and i feel like everybody else you know the artist usually and and everybody around the artists are always like yeah we should do this and we should do this and it's like falling on deaf ears usually you know so this is a good platform for that kind of thing i think to to and it's important again to just pass it forward for us to kind of hold on to these practices to call people out call your friends out but not in a don't like dis own them just just you know we need to grow together um, and support each other to evolve but maybe that's also a space for artistic projects like one that comes to mind is collectivize facebook that jonas style initiated some dutch based uh, artist visual performing uh, performance artist uh, he started this project and he has different gatherings um, taking place in different spaces trying to collectivize what we own by don't own meaning all of the content that we put to facebook and he tries to hijack it and it's one of the main uh, let's say features of his artistic practices maybe that's one of the examples or initiatives that we could learn from uh, is there any reaction yeah, hello. Yet? Uh, my name is Hude uh, Hutti uh, I work for Teen for Theatre in for Finland uh, I'm a male white Finn I still have some hair in my head uh, I have a beard I'm dressing mostly red now, and uh, he or him, because even we in Finnish language, we don't have, we have only one sex, <laughs> it's Han. Uh, uh, I'm on my 70s, which means that I have a totally analog background. And uh, Hege was talking, giving us an example from Kirkenes. Uh, Abi mentioned a project called Correspondence, and uh, Marta uh, told about Magda in Warsaw, about fake news and this kind of thing. So the main uh, th uh, skill that uh, combines all this is a combination skills. Mm -hmm. Even we are in a digi digital or analog world, how to communicate. And uh, because I'm uh, representing theater or performing arts, uh, the communication is more and more important in in uh, performing arts. If we are talking about participatory performances, if we are talking about immersive theater, if we are talking about such specific works, uh, so they are full of communication with audiences, with uh, local artists. So how to uh, learn more and develop a communication. Absolutely. I mean, I completely agree. The um, communication and uh, managing people, and this is why this kind of makes me think about my 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 um, artistic practice more than more than my cultural practice in the sense that uh, it's constantly playing with behavioral culture and finding ways to, um, yeah. Uh, think otherwise about how a, a situation can be. Um, for example, I've been working for many years on a project called The Silent Dinners, um, run by Honey Ryan, who's an Australian artist. Um, and it's really just that. It's a silent dinner that you have with a bunch of people um, that you maybe don't know in advance. Usually you don't know them. And uh, what happens there is completely other. And this is actually an experiment in communication. And this is an artistic project that allows for so many other um, ways of communicating that emerge, which are not, it's uncanny because it's, it's not like you're, okay, how are we going to improve our communication? It's a bit like, what if you remove communication from the moment and create and focus on how else we're communicating without language you know the hierarchies are shifting completely um so um but yeah i think i mean i i would just agree with you i think that's a very uh uh astute uh, observation uh that it, ha it has in fact i was thinking recently that all the money that i've made in my life like everything that i've ever been paid for ultimately i mean um predominantly <laughs> has been for my English language skills. You know, it's because I, I, I write well and I speak well and I articulate myself well. And it's like, and this is just how it all boils down to this. So I think you're, you're really right. I mean, yeah. No, 
It's, it's okay. I don't need to respond to that. I, I totally agree. It's very important. Yeah. I saw that there is another question or comment in the room. Not really. Thank you. Hi, I'm Laura Kangasnemi from the Performance Arts Center in Finland. And I have a, my question is twofold, but uh, it has to do with the other side of the occasion, which is the audience, I think. And uh, in your experience, uh, as we all know, the uh, online audience has a very short attention span. And uh, have you noticed that the change in the medium and space as we move partially at least into the digital agora does it change the medium and expression of the art itself and uh because the audience is audience reach is potentially bigger but does it lack interconnection between the artist and the audience and are there new audience qualities that might compensate for that and uh secondly maybe uh especially directed at Hege, that uh, in your experience, can live and performance art as it is now ever truly be transformed into digital space when the connection between live audience and the artist is not there or is at least drastically different? And uh, it would be interesting in hearing if you have any like good experiences when that has been like successfully made and uh uh yeah yeah as i we had a, a meeting before this uh event and i told these guys that uh, for me it's kind of hard to stand here in this and, and talk about uh, all the good things about being digital because i represent an art form that really only exists live so of course there are good examples that uh, we that yeah, it has a potential, but I wouldn't say that I have I, I have myself experienced very good uh, performance digitally today that I could say this is the way to do it. I think, but it, I guess it's a potential there to develop it. And there's a lot of new technology like VR that could be used to make it more, um, to, to give the experience more, to have more quality. Uh, so I can't give you uh, any good examples, I would say, today. But of course, the, the thing that we see is that there's a lot of, especially the theater institutions, because they have a lot of money, you know? So they, in, in the pandemic, many of them have experience with um, streaming their performances and have actually reached a huge, uh, much broader audience. And of course, that would be very interesting for them. But it's also um, a, a study, I think it's Wolf Brown, that has a, have, have a study they have studied the audience experience and the the, the thing i found f interesting with that audience in that, that um, research is that they also point out that the audience also needs to have good technology technology equipment if they're going to have a good experience so if you're going to sit home uh, at your it, it watch a performance at the television it needs to be a very good quality if not they won't have a good experience so that would be the, the artists should have a good equipment to make the to do the digital um, uh, the virtual travel, uh, but also the audience needs to have a good equipment to enjoy it and to have a good experience. Uh, can I add to that? I would just like to add an example um, because basically um, I have a friend. Her name is Zirak Emma, and she goes by the moniker Slow Spin. Uh, and she's a musician and a visual artist. And I witnessed her hosting a workshop as she's a sound artist, basically, in this context. And she hosted a workshop on Zoom. So the point of what I'm trying to say here is the size of the group on online. So she hosted a workshop for like five people or something. And um, I happened to tune it tune in but this was a slightly longer like they were all engaged a bit longer than me i had just came in to see my friend play a show and it was just a sound meditation 
And what I witnessed there within like a 40 minute set that she played, it was just music tech wise. She, she, cause I called her later and said, how did you get your sound functioning and stuff? And she said, actually, I didn't even have to, I, I tried a few things and I ditched the technology of plugging my sound into the zoom and sending it like that. In fact, I just played it in my space and let my computer take it. And I realized that was, that worked out best for me. So she went with the low tech version, but it was really, it was so powerful. These people in the workshop were then feedbacking saying like you, you know, I've never had the room to feel these. And the way that she set up the, the, the sound bath, it was for, you know, it was an emotional space that she created for people to really feel through the sound and stuff. And it was, um shocking i was shocked to see how moved people were by this experience and i was like whoa okay so my friend is a contemporary shaman uh making making spiritual sound baths by you know and i just found this really fascinating how effective it was and i think a lot of that has to do with the size of the group and the engagement of the group whereas mm -hmm. if i think if it was a big broadcast then you just have people coming in and out thanks so much to both of you for reacting to that i saw there is another question Okay. Not really, no. Can we maybe exchange? Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. now it works. Yeah. Hi. Um, Leticia, I am a consultant based in London. Uh, I am middle aged, me, mid 40s, short white, uh, short gray, not white yet, but it will come. <laughs> short hair, uh, jacket. Uh, what else? She and her. Um, uh, interestingly, uh, that you mentioned the low tech and the frugal sort of approach to to digital. I'm interested to hear to to hear what's your take on the digital well-being, the notion of digital mm -hmm. well-being, and how it affects our relationship to time. Uh, how I mean, for many of us with care responsibility, the pandemic hasn't been a time where we could relax. Uh, the the not only obviously the homeschooling and all, all the invasion of other responsibility we had, but also the how the digital, um, the, the, the working through digital has really expanded our working time, potentially the invasion of work uh, on, our, on our daily life. So how it impacts our mental well-being, but also our physical well-being. We've changed posture. We're all, I mean, we're all curving down from the virtual column. I'm doing yoga uh, aside, and that's a very important notion. And but also how uh, di uh, digital well-being also affects our relationship to time in an accelerated mode, uh, mm -hmm. in a sort of like vain quest of catching up with innovation. And I feel that I mean there are obviously there's um, really technical innovation that we need we need to to get right if we want to produce really good content. But meanwhile, it puts a lot of pressure on a sector, on a, a sector, cultural sector, or every sector to sort of catching up with digital innovation that we will never really, I mean, completely master, right? So there are constantly these sort of buzzwords that are coming in. So now it's the metaverse, two, three years ago was the blockchain, and then before it was the VR. So we all like, so it is a question of generation, obviously. So we talk a lot about the digital pressure on children, or how um, interacting only through screens modify their brain development. We talk a lot about all the elderly people and how they are not equipped uh, mentally with engaging with digital. But I think it concerns also all, I mean, all generation and how the, yeah, the acceleration of time is inevitably producing an over is inevitably participating in a capitalist overproduction uh, notion of time. Right. So things, sorry. We have really lost two and a half minutes to yes. react to that. You, Would you like okay. to? Okay, you can I can take that. It. That's fine. The, uh, I think that the paradox has existed before. I think the acceleration movement has existed before the COVID and everything. So, and then the reason I call it the paradox is because because there's something to be said about the fact that I can speak very quickly and when I can speak to you very quickly, then our ideas can, you know, move really quickly and grow really quickly and we can build something quite quickly. And that is a very easy, lovely space for a lot of us, especially in language barriers, you know, we'll speak in French because we can and it's easier um, as soon as we know we can, you know. 
and on the flip side, there's the slow care, which like now we really have to care for everybody and allow for more spaces for care. So, I, I mean, it's a very basic answer is I think we're all aware of it, but we need to implement it more is balance. It's really about balance and really caring because, and also I think it's cyclical. I think that, you know, in soon it will become really way more important to be disconnected and for the kids to have really spent time playing with real toys and this kind of thing, you know, and it, it, it will come back around for sure. And it, or maybe it never really left. I definitely think, you know, we don't need to build cyborgs. I think we need to stay in touch with the real world, with the natural world. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. And immediately it made me think of the shamanism or the kind of cyber shamanism that you were describing. Maybe that's also the way to, the, to experience different pace. Um, I'm afraid we really need to wrap up now. So um, just wanted to say thank you, Abby. Thank you, Haga, for, for this conversation. And I really hope it's just the beginning. I will not dare to conclude anything. We are definitely not at the moment to uh, have any conclusions. But what I just would love to underline as a kind of main takeaway from this conversation, a proposal for the further food for thought is that to think about the digital space as a very political one all the time. It's never enough of saying and voicing that out and, and explaining and articulating it this way and then understanding from which perspective the politicality unfolds in which way would be uh, a super interesting next step. Thank you so much for that. You. Marie? Thank you very much for the three of you and for this very rich panel and also for all the questions that were raised. Um, we have also more than 55 people following us online, so which is great, like very attentive audience. There was no specific question, but there were like some comments and I would just say two because I think it's important to share them. One of the recommendations, and I guess it goes in line with what you were saying, artists needs to be in the same place as leaders of funding organization and mm -hmm. come up with realistic and practical roadmap. So also in line with uh, the, the, the topic of professional development program, but not only. And there was also a special request to maybe for the next um, maybe edition, and I, I, I guess it falls very right with the next edition that we will hear about uh, tonight for the cultural mobility series to focus also very much on the African context in terms of digital professional development program. And I would like mm -hmm. to highlight that online we have André Leroux, uh, from South Africa, who wrote uh, also um, uh, an article uh, on um, the experimentation of a digital mobility fund for musicians in South Africa, and it's in the Cultural Mobility Yearbook. So I just wanted also to share that, you know, in a way, on behalf uh, of, of the group that is following us uh, online. Thank you very much once again. You have a good one hour break. Uh, we come back at 1.30 p.m. Uh, time in Finland and we will move to a related topic, um, digital mobility still, but more from the perspective on environmental sustainability. Thank you very much. Thank you.